Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, 2022 Medicare Regulatory Update, IPPS Final Rule. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I am pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Michael Noel, partner, Glenn Bunting, Director, and Jonathan Mason, Director. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Michael to go over the agenda. Mike? Thank you, Amy. And thanks everyone today for joining. We, we appreciate your uh, time. Um, Glenn and Jonathan will be carrying the, the load for this uh, presentation today, but I wanted to uh, kick it off and just briefly cover the agenda so, so we know where we're going. Um, we're going to begin with an overview of, of some DRG and, and classification changes. Then we're going to talk about uh, the changes to the payment rates and, and how we got from last year to this year. And we'll also touch on some activity that's brewing with regarding to uh, medical education uh, reimbursement and, uh, and uh, legislation surrounding that. And then we'll finish with a rather comprehensive discussion uh, surrounding wage index. There's a lot going on in, in that area. And then from there, we'll pivot to, to Jonathan, and we'll do a, a fairly deep dive into Medicare DISH and uncompensated care reimbursement. Um, and then we'll sort of wrap it up with touching on the Section 1115 uh, waiver proposal that ultimately was not enacted, and also the repeal of the market-based um, data collection. If we have time at the end, we'll, we'll field uh, uh, questions as they come in. If, if we run out of time, we'll follow up with um, with those asking questions in, in the next few days. However, don't wait till the end to, to submit a question. I, I suggest you, you do it along the way uh, as it, something might pop up that's relevant to a discussion that Glenn is uh, carrying on or, or that Jonathan is carrying on, and we'll, and we'll try to um, take it from there. So with that as setting the stage, I think uh, first we're going to hit our first polling question. So I'm going to turn it back over to Amy to handle that for us. All right, thank you. So our first polling question, 
Do you or your team regularly review CMS's IPPS rulemaking? A, yes, B, no, or C, unsure? And we will give you a few moments to respond. Uh, to respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you cannot see the submit button, uh, you will need to enlarge your slide area. And just a reminder, if you want CPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions that we pull up throughout the webcast. We'll leave it up for another five seconds here. Okay, here are the results. So this is obviously uh, good numbers. Um, certainly, it, it, in in your capacity, it's not only interesting and 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 relevant to review the the various rules, both proposed and final. But I think there's a lot of benefit in also reviewing the the comments and and the replies from CMS where they choose to reply. So so that's good. And for those of you that um, aren't necessarily in, engaged with that, I, I certainly encourage you to do so. So with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn this now over to, to Glenn Bunting. Glenn? All right. Thank you, Mike, and good day, everyone. Um, MSDRGs, there's always a lot of change in this area. So we're going to highlight some of the uh, items that are really good news. And, and this is on the uh, new technology add-on payments um, and that, that front. So as background, uh, Medicare pays the applicable MSDRG payment rate and up, up to an additional 65% of the cost of approved new technology. So the new technology add-on payment is, it's not budget neutral and is generally limited to a two to three year period following the date the product begins to become available. So CMS is extending for one year uh, new technology add-on payments that were set to expire for 13 technologies. Uh, CMS approved 19 technologies for fiscal year uh, 2022, including nine technologies under the FDA Breakthrough Device Program and two technologies under the FDA Qualified Infectious Disease Product Designation. And CMS estimates that adding the new technologies for 2022 to those continuing from prior years, including the exception for 13 that were set to expire, this is going to result in new technology add-on payments for in uh, federal fiscal year 2022 of approximately 1.5 billion. Um, these changes were set forth in the proposed rule, um, and they were adopted as is in the final rule. There's also uh, new COVID-19 treatment add-on payments. Uh, these were added during the pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 add-on payments will be available for eligible products through the end of the fiscal year in which the pandemic ends, which, as we all know, we don't know when this is going to end, so this could go on for quite some time. Uh, however, there was one change from the proposed rule. Uh, hospitals will be able to receive both uh, new COVID technology, um, I'm sorry, new COVID treatment add-on payments and new and uh, new technology add-on payments for qualifying patients with the new technology add-on payment reducing the new COVID technology add-on payment. So you get both, but maybe not the full amount. Also, uh, there's an update uh, regarding the CAR-T cell therapy. There's a new MSDRG. Um, this was a new technology add-on payment a few years ago that eventually has evolved into its own MSDRG payment group. The new payment group will provide payment flexibility for the future as new CAR-T cell therapies uh, become available. So from there, we're gonna uh, move into payment rates. Um, IPPS payment rates are expected to increase 2.5% on average for acute care hospitals that participate in both the hospital IQR program and our meaningful EHR users. So this breaks down to a 2.7% market basket adjustment upward. Um, and then there's a negative multi-factor productivity adjustment 
And then finally, there's a half a percent uh, legislative add back adjustment. So what this all does is it, it boils down to urban hospitals are projected to receive 2.6% higher payments than the prior year. Rural hospitals are projected to receive 2.8% higher payments than the prior year. And then overall acute care hospital net payments are expected to increase by 2.3 billion as compared to the current federal fiscal year 2021. Um, all of these increases are very similar to the prior year. So if you're looking at this from year to year to year, it, it's all very, very similar. Um, but one of the larger questions that arose from the proposed rule was which data set is CMS going to use for the federal fiscal year 2022 rates? Is it the 2019 data set or the 2020 data set? Uh, CMS's goal is to use the best available data overall when setting inpatient hospital payment rates for the upcoming fiscal year. So for 2022, ordinarily the best available full year of data to approximate the expected federal fiscal year 2022 inpatient hospital utilization would be data from fiscal year 2020. However, the fisc as we know, the fiscal year 2020 data reflects changes to inpatient hospital utilization driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. So CMS stated the vaccinations in the Medicare populations coupled with the effectiveness of the vaccines leads us to believe that there will be significantly lower risk of COVID-19 infection and fewer hospitalizations for COVID-19 in fiscal year 2022 than occurred in fiscal year 2020. So therefore, we are using the fiscal year 2019 data from prior, which is from prior to the COVID-19 pandemic to approximate the expected fiscal year 2022 inpatient hospital use, utilization. So they really wanted to take COVID out of the equation. And I think what they're thinking is, is it, this was kind of a one-time event um, and, and, you know, going forward, we should be okay. But now, since they've actually issued the final rule, which came out in early August, there's been all of this COVID uh, activity. So it's gonna be interesting to see how CMS proceeds going forward into 2023 and beyond. So on your screen is a comparison and breakdown of the fiscal year 2022 DRG payment rates by labor, non-labor capital, as compared to the current fiscal year 2021 DRG payment rates. Uh, the Medicare per discharge payment rates uh, are $166.79 higher or 2.53% greater than the current fiscal year 2021 rates. However, the final rates are approximately $17.87 lower than the rate shown um, earlier this year in the proposed rule, which is not uncommon. Um, many times when the final rule comes out and you compare it to the proposed rule, those rates drop slightly. And that's, this year is no different. In this slide, um, what we're doing here is we're illustrating all of the legislative adjustments, all the pluses and the minuses that are applied to the development of the national standardized base rates in fiscal year 2022. Uh, typically, but not always, changes made by CMS to the base rates are applied in a budget neutral manner. So this means when one hospital qualifies for a favorable adjustment through the budget neutrality adjustments, all hospitals absorb this difference in reduced base rates. Um, the next slide touches on quality data and meaningful use adjustments. And this slide is, is intended to illustrate the payment adjustments that are applied to hospitals that meet quality data submission standards and are approved as an electronic health record meaningful use user versus those that don't meet this criteria. So if we look at this slide and we kind of go from left to right, um, the second column there shows the increases that um, are applied to those that have both uh, or, or meet both quality data submitted and are meaningful users. But if you slide to the next column to the right, kind of in the middle, um, quality, if you, if, you, um, are, if you meet the quality data submission, but you're not a meaningful user, you actually get a reduction to your payment 
Um, and then uh, again, if you go to the next column to the right, you have quality data not submitted, but you are a meaningful user. Uh, you are getting a, an increase, but not the full amount. And then finally, if you, if you don't submit quality data and you're not a meaningful user, you get the worst adjustment. So that's, that's kind of how CMS has set up their uh, scheme. It's also worth mentioning that every year there's an annual recalibration of payments. So using claims and cost report data, each year CMS recalibrates the DRG weights. So interestingly, Medicare managed care claims are excluded from this process, even though the number of Medicare managed care claims grows every year. The recalibration process resets costly hospital acquired conditions claims into higher severity DRGs, and then the MedPAR claims data is trimmed to remove statistical outliers and incomplete data. And then from here, you take that result and the cost of services are determined using data from cost reports. We have another slide that sets forth the, average, the national average cost to charge ratios. Um, and this shows the final cost to charge ratios using MedPAR and cost report data for the last three years. You'll notice the final cost to charge ratios for fiscal year 2022 are the same as the prior year, fiscal year 2021, because CMS utilized the prior year 2019 data set in lieu of the newer 2020 day, data set that contained COVID information. So from here, I'm gonna turn it back to Amy and she'll lay out uh, polling question number two. All right, thank you. So the next polling question is, changes in cost to charge ratios affect A, outlier payments on claims, B, calculation of uncompensated care on worksheet S10, C, rate setting, D, cost report settlements for critical access hospitals, or E, all of the above. And we have had a few people asking if we will have copies of the slides and a recording of the webcast, and the answer is yes. And we will be sending those out tomorrow via email. We'll leave this up for another five seconds here. Okay, here are the results. Yeah, E is, is the correct answer. So I can tell um, from this question, we have a pretty astute uh, audience uh, with us today. Very, very good, well done. I want to touch a little bit here on uh, what's going on with outliers and the fixed loss uh, threshold. So in the final rule, uh, the final outlier threshold for 2020 um, has been determined to be $30,988. And when you compare that to the current year or, or fiscal year 2021, the final outlier threshold uh, is $29,051. So the threshold has gone up slightly. Uh, what CMS does is they estimate the threshold to result in outlier payments of 5.1% of total operating DRG payments. Um, if you go back to 2020, CMS estimated that for that year, they paid out 5.47% uh, of outliers uh, compared to DRG payments. So it's no surprise um, that when CMS feels like they're paying out more, or, or I shouldn't say feels, they they determine that they're paying out more. Uh, what they do is they increase that threshold. And then the opposite is true. When they um, calculate that they're not quite meeting the 5.1% uh, threshold, they will, um, or payments, they will drop that threshold down. Also, capital, I, capital outliers um, have, have been determined to be 5.31% of federal capital payments. From here, I'm gonna uh, move into graduate uh, medical education. Um, in the proposed rule, uh, they talked about the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, and it included three provisions impacting payments to teaching hospitals. Uh, there's a section 
uh, 126 that requires the allotment of an additional thousand new Medic Medicare funded graduate medical education residency uh, positions to train physicians. Um, there is 1,000 GME slots that will be phased in beginning in fiscal year 2023 with an emphasis on prioritizing applications from hospitals that serve, that serve areas with the most need for healthcare professionals. Uh, Section 127 uh, made changes to the determination of urban and rural FTE resident limits and the rolling three-year average used to calculate payments. And then finally, there was a Section 131 uh, that impacts GME per resident amount and GME and IME FTE resident limits for hospitals that hosted a small number of residents uh, for a short duration. Uh, due to the number and nature of comments that CMS received on their proposed policies, uh, CMS decided to address the public comments in a separate document. So the final rule does not indicate when providers can expect CMS to finalize its implementation of these statutory changes. So there, you just, we're just gonna have to wait and see. There's more to come on this topic. So from here, we're gonna pivot into Medicare, the Medicare wage index update. Um, interesting in terms of new proposals that were offer, offered up in the IPPS preliminary rule, uh, CMS is reestablishing the imputed floor primarily because Congress uh, stepped in. Uh, CMS originally implemented the imputed floor in a budget neutral manner, meaning that CMS reduced payments to hospitals nationwide to pay for the imputed floor. Uh, CMS discontinued the imputed floor in fiscal year 2019 because it was concerned that the budget neutrality adjustment was putting hospitals in states with rural areas at a disadvantage. So what happens next? In steps Congress. Uh, Section 9831 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, this was enacted in March, on March 11th of 2021, instructs CMS to revive the imputed floor policy with the modification that it will not be applied in a budget neutral, neutral manner. So accordingly, CMS is now reestablishing its imputed floor policy beginning in fiscal year 2022 without imposing a budget neutrality adjustments. Thus, hospitals that receive the benefit of this change will not be gaining a benefit at the expense of others because budget neutrality adjustment factor will not be implemented. Another new change uh, originating from the IPPS preliminary rule is a finalization to address the timing for canceling rural status. So CMS is proposing changing when a hospital can request to cancel its election to reclassify as rural. Uh, Medicare statute and regulations permit hospitals to elect to reclassify as rural for purposes of the prospective payment systems. So when a hospital makes this election, its wage and hours data is included in the rural area wage index for the following federal fiscal year, unless the hospital cancels its reclassification 120 days prior to the beginning of that year. CMS had proposed to eliminate its 120-day its rule, but at the end of the day, it elected to not finalize this proposal. So the 120-day the rule continues to stand unchanged. Um, but CMS has observed that hospitals in certain states are reclassifying as rural, and canceling their reclassification soon after approval so that their wage data does not negatively affect the rural wage index in the following year. So it, to address this, CMS is finalizing its proposal or has finalized its proposal to impose a minimum one year time period between the time a hospital reclassifies as rural and the time it may cancel that election. Um, these revisions are consistent with CMS's stated long standing practice of implementing policy aimed at achieving equity for all IPPS providers. CMS also decided to again adopt a wage index stop loss policy in fiscal year 2022, like the policies they adopted in fiscal year 2020 and 2021 although this time it's more limited in scope. 
Um, specifically, in fiscal year 2022, CMS had adopted a 5% cap on any decreases in wage index compared to uh, fiscal year 2021. However, unlike in previous years where the policy applied to all hospitals nationwide, in fiscal year 2022, the 5% cap will only be applied to hospitals that receive what's called transition adjustments in fiscal year 2021. So what's a transition adjustment? This pertains to somebody who receives a low wage adjustment and or an OMB Bulletin 18-04 geographic delineation change. Uh, CMS has also made a budget neutrality adjustment to the standardized amount to offset the increased payments resulting from this change. Uh, if a hospital was not eligible for a stop loss policy adjustment in 2021, Irrespective of their status in 2022, a stop loss will not be applied. Uh, CMS will continue its low wage index hospital policy that it first adopted though in 2020. So under this policy, CMS makes upward adjustments to the wage indices of hospitals with a wage index value below the 25th percentile. The adjustment for each eligible hospital is equal to half the difference between the otherwise applicable final uh, wage index value for the hospital and the 25th percentile wage index value for all hospitals that same year. So for fiscal year 2022, CMS is setting that 25th percentile wage index value at 0.8437. This, this value is very similar to what they published in the, per, in the preliminary rule. Um, as in past years, CMS uh, will fund these adjustments by making a budget neutrality adjustment to the standardized amount. Uh, there also were some changes to the Medicare Geographic Classification Review Board, or we refer to it as MGCRB rules. So as, as background, uh, the Medicare statute permits hospitals to apply to the MGCRB to be paid according to the wage index of a neighboring area. Uh, re relatedly, urban hospitals can apply to CMS to be treated as if they were located in the rural part of the state for all purposes of the prospective payment system. An urban hospital that's been reclassified as rural can apply to the MGCRB to be paid according to the wage index of its home area instead of the rural wage index. So under existing MGCRB rules, an applicant hospital is required to demonstrate that its average hourly wages are a certain percentage greater than the wages of other hospitals in its home area. We, re we refer to this as a wage test. Um, additionally, a hospital is prohibited from applying to the MGCRB uh, to reclassify to an area that has a pre-reclassified average hourly wage that's lower than the pre-reclassified average hourly wage of its home area. So for purposes of both these rules, CMS considers a hospital's home area to be the area in which it is physically located. Even if the hospital has, been, has elected to be treated as if it were located in the rural part of its state through say a rural reclassification. Um, there were hospitals recently successfully challenged this policy in Bates County Memorial Hospital versus Azar. So interestingly, in that case, six urban hospitals that have elected to reclassify as rural, they were denied geographic reclassification because their average hourly wages were compared to their geographic home areas. The hospitals contended that because they were reclassified rural hospitals, their average hourly wages should have been compared to the average hourly wages of the hospitals in the rural areas of their respective states. Um, the district, the DC district court ruled for the plaintiff hospitals and the government, they did not appeal. Um, there's at least one urban hospital we work with that elected to become rural years ago that is expected to benefit from the Bates County decision. And I suspect there are many hospitals out there that would benefit from this decision. So consequently, if an urban hospital reclassifies as rural, its eligibility for geographic reclassification will be determined based on a comparison of its average hourly wage to the average hourly wages of the hospitals located in the rural area of the state. In addition, in determining whether the area to which the hospital seeks to reclassify has a lower 
correctly classified average hourly wage than the hospital's home, CMS will compare the pre-reclassified average hourly wage of the target area to the pre-reclassified average hourly wage of the rural area of the state. Uh, CMS issued this change as an interim final rule that makes changes to the rules for applying for geographic reclassification with the MGCRB. Uh, the interim final rule is effective May 10th of this year. Uh, comments to that interim final rule were due June 28th. And long story short, these revisions to these rules are uh, in effect for the reclassification, reclassification filings, uh, which were due last week on September 1st. Um, finally, we have a slide, a couple of slides here that uh, touch on the upcoming wage index occupational mix deadlines. Uh, last week was the deadline for hospitals to request revisions to wage index and occupational mix survey data, um, if applicable. Uh, so right now we're, we're in a, a position where the MACs are starting to do their review of wage index and occupational mix data. Um, that review is, is going to go on until about the middle of, of November. Um, and that's November 15th is a deadline for the MACs to complete that process. Um, the MACs then transmit that data to CMS, and on or about January 28th of next year, CMS will release that data to the public. Um, and at that point, it's on the public to identify any sort of a disagreement that they might have with that data. And there's a February 15th deadline for hospitals to submit requests, including supporting documentation. Um, but you can't submit any new documentation. So it's, it's only uh, documentation and requests related to ongoing adjustments. Um, and then from there, there's a series of deadlines that take place all the way up until you get to the point where the data becomes final and it's used, it'll be used in the federal fiscal year 2023 uh, 20, um, inpatient rule. So with that, I'm gonna uh, kick it back over to Amy for our third polling question. All right, thank you. So our third question is, have you conducted any recent analysis to determine if your facility is eligible for a geographic reclassification in an attempt to receive higher reimbursement payments? A, yes, B, no, C, unsure, or D, not applicable? And just a reminder, you do need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And once you have completed all the CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate uh, from the CPE progress window in your console. All right, it looks like most have responded. So here are the results. It's, it's good to see that the majority um, are looking at geographic reclassification. I, I think this is an area that where uh, folks need to really pay attention because the geographic boundaries that we're all used to are gonna be changing in a few years. Um, and you know, if you can keep your wage index data uh, stated at a very robust level, um, this can open up opportunities to get a higher wage index value. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, pivot over to Jonathan Mason, and he will guide us through uh, all the updates with Medicare DISH and uncompensated care. All righty. Well, thank you, Glenn. You know, now we'll spend a good portion of the rest of our time covering this UC payment section of the rule and understanding how the pool size was determined and ultimately the calculation to distribute those funds to Medicare DISH eligible hospitals. You know, there was a pretty significant drop in the size of the distribution between this year's rule and last year, and we'll dive into what made up those changes. So just to set the stage for everyone listening, the size of the UC payment fund is first determined by two factors. Factor one is the difference between an estimate of what would have been paid to qualifying hospitals under the historical DISH formula, and then the 25% empirically justified amount. Uh, the source of this estimate is the most recent available projections of Medicare DISH from the CMS actuary, the most recent filed cost reports from qualified hospitals, 
and the most recent DISH data from the IPPS impact file. So the DISH estimate begins with an anchor period. Uh, in this case, it's the 2018 data, which is then trended forward by a number of factors applied to the 2019 through 2022 periods. The story here is that there have been some significant changes in these so-called roll forward factors, in large part due to the assumptions made regarding utilization under COVID, as well as a migration from fee-for-service to Medicare Advantage plans. You may recall in the, that in the final rule for the 2021, CMS Office of the Actuary stated, quote, since we do not know how many Medicare beneficiaries will choose to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, or how the remaining fee-for-service enrollees will use hospital services, or the total impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is much uncertainty in these numbers. So I'm not gonna go into the specific factors one by one, but as you can see on this slide, green represents an increase compared to the 21 final rule and red a decrease. But let's look at the end result as it compares to uh, fiscal year 2021. In terms of the starting point, the so-called baseline cost report, the uh, column titled DISH, you'll start to see the differences. Uh, the estimate for 2019 is now 14.082 billion, but last year it was 14.93 billion. The estimate for 2020 now is 12.8, but last year it was 14.5. That's a huge difference of 1.7 billion. And now the 2021 estimate is now 13.2, I think while last year it was 15.1. So at this point, the trended starting point is close to $2 billion less than the fiscal year 2021 estimate made last year. You know, and then for 2022, the factors increase such that the, that the final projection is 13.985 billion, or a little more than 1 billion less than last year's estimate. I think one notable item in the trending is that discharge column. And so you may recall, and as I started out this discussion, there were some material changes in the fiscal year 2021 rule versus prior year relative to the projected fee-for-service discharges due to COVID and the migration to the Medicare Advantage plan. And so CMS in this final rule indicates that the 20 to 22 values reflect the estimated impact of COVID without further analysis. And so in fact, 2021 is based on preliminary data that utilizes the completion factor to estimate what the rest of the year will look like. And then 2022 is based on, quote, recent trends recovering back to long-term trends. So we'll just have to wait and see how that all plays out. So the net result is a 2022 DISH estimate of 13.985 billion. So after removing the 25 empirically justified amounts, the final rule factor one is 10.489 billion. Again, significantly less than fiscal year 2021, coming in at uh, 889 million less than last year's total. So here's a view of factor one from a trending standpoint since 2014. Factor one was increasing at an average about 4.6% through 2020 before falling dramatically in 2021, um, an 8.5% drop. And now in 2022, another 8% drop. But remember the baseline period for the 22 the 2022 projection is, uh, is dished from the fiscal year 2018 cost reports. Uh, so at this point, the impact on computed dish during the COVID pandemic period which obviously we're still in, is based on CMS projections. And so as the baseline period rolls forward, the actual impact on DISH from the pandemic period will begin impacting the estimate of factor one with 2020 becoming the baseline for the 2024 estimates and 2021 becoming the baseline for the 2025 estimates. And that's obviously if CMS stays on the current methodology. So just from a long-term uh, planning standpoint, Estimating UC payments for your individual hospitals and systems has now gotten even more complex, not only due to the kind of the impact or estimated impact of COVID, 
but now also the impact of the audits that have been conducted and will continue to be conducted. And, that, and we'll touch on that in just a minute. So for factor two, now the short story here is that CMS is elected to basically utilize a similar methodology uh, to the, what they employed since 2018. However, as with last year's rulemaking cycle, there are questions regarding how the implications of the pandemic are factored into the uninsured rate that is being estimated for 2021 and 2022, and not to mention the other items in flux. And so in the proposed rule, CMS stated that they may use more recent data that becomes available for purposes of estimating the rate of uninsured. And as we'll see on the next slide, they did in fact use updated information from the final rule, but this updated data showed a decrease in the estimated uninsured rate. Uh, a detailed description of the methodology used to, to update the estimates can be found in an addendum to the certification rates of the uninsured on CMS's website. You know, in the letter, the downward revisions to the uninsured rate relative to the proposed rule are largely represented by what CMS states are significant gains in Medicaid enrollment data compared to previous projections. CMS kind of goes on to state, quote, this growth in Medicaid, despite continued gains in employment, is influenced by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act's maintenance of effort provision which provides incentives for states not to disenroll Medicaid enrollees for the duration of public health emergency. They also go on to state the lower uninsured rate also reflects faster than anticipated employment growth, an increasingly improving economic outlook according to blue chip consensus forecasts for the unemployment rate and marketplace enrollment gains attributable to the special enrollment period. So for calendar years 2020 and 21, the estimated uninsured rate is 9.8% and 9.5%. The, the calendar year values are then converted to a payment year using a weighted average approach to get to 9.6%. So after running it through the formula, factor two now equals 68.57% as compared to last year's final rule of 72.86%. That's a pretty big dip, and couple, and, and couple that with a drop in the factor one amount, hospitals are now splitting a significantly smaller pool amount. So to get to that final UC pool calculation, you then apply the 68.57% uninsured rate to the 10.489 billion to derive an uncompensated care pool of 7.192 billion that will be distributed to 2,351 qualifying hospitals. You know, this represents a decrease of over a billion dollars compared to last year's final rule totals. So as you can see from a trending perspective, the UC pool in 2014 was uh, 9.033 billion and then steadily declined as the rate of the uninsured declined in the US or at least what was estimated to decline using CBO data. But since the switch to the new metric in 2018, and as a result of the changes to various factors that impact coverages or coverage decisions under the Affordable Care Act, the rate of uninsured ticked up in 2018 and 2019, with it basically being flat in 2020 and 21. And so now we see in 2022 that big drop from the factor one and factor two updates. So for the actual distribution of the uh, pool, audited S10 data from the 2018 cost reports is being used with a couple exceptions noted on the slide. And so as I alluded to earlier, and as we'll see in just a minute, the results of the audits did have an impact on the distribution of the pool, even if your specific numbers did not change from as filed to audited, given that this is a fixed pool, or a fixed pool subject to the redistribution of dollars. So obviously, you're only in control of your reported data, so there's a significant premium on both accumulating your data according to policies and reporting that data correctly. Also, if you're not active in policy review and revision based on changes in your operation and or kind of economic circumstances of your geographic area and patient population, 
you may not be accurately capturing your uncompensated care costs. And so this should be a high focus area for your reimbursement and finance and revenue cycle teams. A quick note here, again, CMS is attempting to neutralize the impact on data due to the pandemic. So previously, interim payments were based on a three-year average, but, that, uh, but this is now being reduced to a two-year average to eliminate the use of 2020 for fear that it would potentially underpay hospitals. So, uh, however, remember that this allocation is fixed, uh, so it is subject to true up at cost report filing. So this is something that should be monitored throughout the year. So as we move our discussion to the prior year audits and how they impacted the hospital factor three calculation in the 2022 rule, we did wish want to recap some comments made in this year and last year's rulemaking regarding the S10 audits. So there, there's a theme with the comments that hospitals want these audits to be completed equitably across the country. And as we look at the next couple of slides, we'll see the results of these audits and how they impacted a hospital's UC payment calculation. Uh, but before we get to that, Amy, I think it's time for um, our next polling question. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. So our last polling question is, given the continued increase in regulatory reporting and reimbursement changes, how do you feel about your or your organization's bandwidth? A, we are good. B, we struggle, but we stay on top of issues. C, we are not keeping up at all or D, we outsource and let someone else worry about that? And again, this is the last polling question for the webcast, if you need it for your CPE. And also, I do wanna note, uh, thank you to those who've been submitting your questions for the presenters. Uh, just a reminder, if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Okay, here are the results. All right. Uh, I, I guess there's a pretty good mix of answers here and Kind of certainly during this unprecedented time with COVID, there's there's less bandwidth with providers than ever before. Uh, you know, dealing with all the the recent regulatory and reporting changes. So as we move forward, uh, wanted to go over a few. Uh, the next couple slides is basically a compar a comparison of the fiscal year 2018 S10 numbers between the as filed values and the revised values that resulted from either amendments or audits. And so here we have a we have the group that changed um, some 2,079 hospitals that had revised values during the period June 2020 and June 2021. And so in the aggregate line 30, which drives the factor three calculation, decreased by 1.6 billion or 5%. Uh, and that's this is the uncompensated care cost removed from hospitals resulting primarily for the audits. And so to break this down a little further by looking at all reported charity charges on line 20, of the 2,079 hospitals that had a line 30 change, 1,915 reflected a change in their reported charity charges. Both uninsured charity and insured charity went down but un uninsured went down by 40.6 million. But as you can see, insured charity went down by 1.2 billion or 23%. And this finding is consistent with what we saw uh, last year. And it, it appears that hospitals seems, uh, to, are still struggling with reporting deductible coinsurance and copayments amounts to that insured column. Uh, and the real story here is that that insured charity is not subject to the cost to charge ratio. So there's a dollar for dollar impact on line 30 and a massive hit to the hospital's calculated UC payment. Bad debts have continued to be a focus in 
uh, in these audits and will continue to be in these kinds of findings if, if these kinds of findings continue. So almost 1,900 hospitals had a change to this line to the tune of $3.3 billion or a 7.88 reduction. And to just give you a sense of the overall movement still in the, uh, in, in the reported S10 numbers, the average line 30 change was $780,000, with the largest decrease being $160 million, with that estimated kind of lost allocation of $41 million. And so that largest increase you can see is $47 million. That's in reimbursement um, pickup on their UC payment of a little bit more than $12 million. So needless to say, there's still a lot of movement in the numbers, and per CMS's comments in the final rule, these audits will continue accordingly. So what are the next, some of the next steps and best practices in terms of UC and Medicare DISH? You know, as we mentioned earlier, MACs are currently performing worksheet S10 audits on all federal 2019 fiscal years. Uh, right now, hospital systems really need to designate an individual or a team of individuals to prepare the S10 for filing and support during this audit process. These S10 reports take a considerable amount of time and resources to prepare. And so in order to accurately report charity and bad debt and to maximize the uncompensated care reported on S10, there needs to be a coordination between the designated S10 preparer and the reimbursement staff, the revenue cycle, accounting, potentially policy, compliance, um, and, and or legal if revisions are necessary to any policy. So the, the designated S10 preparer will also need to stay abreast of any regulatory changes regarding the reporting of S10, along with the updates on audit findings to better prepare their hospital for future S10 reviews. I think providers should take another look at their federal 2020 cost reports to make sure they've accurately captured all uncompensated care on those reports and decide if they need to amend before they are most likely subject to an audit early next year. And uh, another reminder for you today regarding Medicare DISH and S10 is that CMS uh, is requiring patient level detail that ties to the charity amounts claimed on S10 as well as the Medicare DISH uh, totals at the time of the cost report filing, those those patient detail must be within 3% of the cost report values to be acceptable. Um, and this requirement started with the uh, cost reports 10-1, 18, and after. And just kind of as a last reminder uh, that the filing deadline for DISH amendments based on that OPPS rule timeline is 12 months after the original as-filed cost report deadline. So that's something to also keep in mind as you review the need to amend your reports. And kind of with that, I think I'll now hand it back over to Mike for the uh, last few topics. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, let's touch a, uh, first a little bit on Section 1115 um, waivers. You know, there's a long history rela related to waiver days and what can and cannot be included in the, in the Medicaid fraction of the DISH calculation. It stretches back at least until 2000 when the secretary issued a rule uh, governing this issue. This rule was followed by another in 2004, further clarifying CMS's position. And then some court activity uh, occurred after that. At, at that time, Congress got involved through the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005, and CMS stated that the act remains limited in including expansion populations. That is, patients who can be regarded as eligible for medical assistance under a state plan under Title 19 because they receive benefits through a Section 1115 waiver demonstration project that are comparable to traditional um, uh, Medicaid benefits. So there's been a, a long line of cases, or, or at least three important cases uh, cited here, Bethesda, Forest General, and, and Health Alliance, in which providers ultimately prevailed in having uh, days associated with expansion waivers included in the, the Medicaid fraction of the DISH uh, calculation. And these were, in, in some cases, programs that um, CMS viewed as not having the direct relationship that they believed should be there because there were some that 
you know, manage the program through an uncompensated care pool or, or others that subsidize premium assistance. So the intent was to make a change here to tighten this up in, in CMS's mind. Ultimately, um, CMS stated in the final rule that they, they received a lot of comments that they're going to continue to evaluate and uh, and they'll address this in, in a separate document sometime in the, in the future. So the important thing here is to just keep an eye on what's going on in your state in terms of expansion waivers. They're all over the country. Um, they're all different um, and programs are, are set up differently. Um, and the takeaway is to, to make sure you know you understand the program and, and you're at least preserving your right to claim the days you think you're entitled to in the in the dish calculation. Um, another item that was that was included in the proposed rule that also was ultimately re rescinded uh, had to do with um, the collection of, of certain data. In, in 2021, uh, uh, final rule CMS re required. Um, hospitals to begin reporting uh, Medicare Advantage organization information for cost reporting periods beginning on or after January 1st of, of 21. And the idea was to, to use that data along with the fee-for-service data that's that's already included in the cost reports to help develop uh, the DRG weights for 2024. Um, stakeholders obviously got involved here and CMS in the final rule cited that uh, due to a, a significant reporting uh, collection and reporting burden um, that they were they were not going to enforce that requirement and therefore the the 2024 weights will be, will be computed based on the, the current formula which uses information uh, from claims processing and, and the uh, and, and the current cost reports. Don't know if this will uh, come up again in, in the future, but at least for now, um, this is this is not an issue you have to deal with it in, in these cost reports. Uh, with that, I want to uh, leave you with this resource slide. Here's some uh, uh, places you can go to get some additional information regarding um, uh, items that um, we've put together. One thing I do want to highlight is the is the last bullet point, and that's our 2021 Healthcare Executive Webcast series, which is uh, featuring Liz Fowler. There's a link there for you to follow that'll give you some more information. But included here is a slide of of our speakers and and the and the programs that that will be covered. Um, this is going to be a, a great program with some with some great information, uh, among which is you know, CMS's vision for future payment models and value-based care um, as, as things can continue to transform away from fee-for-service uh, type um, uh, payment programs. Um, and with that, I see we do have uh, maybe a, a minute or two um, for questions. Um, one I'd like to address uh, first is uh, we've had a number of questions asked about when the 2019 SSI fractions are going to be published? And our, my answer is, I don't know. Um, CMS uh, put them up, took them down, um, and, there's, and there's been no activity since. You know, there's, there's kind of a lot going on in the, in the background in, in terms of, of DISH litigation, some of which uh, it affects earlier periods than 2019, but you know, there, there's something going on behind the scenes that's, that's not quite yet been transparent, and therefore there's no real ETA on those um, that I'm aware of. And Glenn, I think I was going to bump it over to you. I think you were going to talk a little bit about maybe Section 127 uh, related to the GME. Yeah, correct, Mike. Um, we did have a question here um, about, uh, first of all, the, the audience member wanted to know if they heard correctly that the uh, Section 127 of the Consolidated Appropriations Act is not finalized, it, and that's true. It's it's not finalized. We had hoped it would be by now. Um, they say they have a hospital that claimed less than two FTEs back in the 90s. That probably set a real low cap for them, and they wanted to know if they could start a new GME program now and not be limited to that 2.0 FTE cap. Um, you know, I guess the the, the the right answer on this is we just kind of have to wait and, and see until that, um, see what 
what the final rule um, yields on, on this matter. Um, I do know that most academic programs start on July 1st. And so, you know, hopefully this will come out um, soon and then we will, you'll have enough time to ramp up and be able to um, incorporate whatever that final rule shows into the next uh, academic cycles that would be starting July 1st of, of 2022. Um, so I think with that, uh, Amy, I think we may be out of time. All right, yes, unfortunately we are um, at time, but thank you, Michael, Glenn, and Jonathan for a great presentation today. And to our audience, feel free to reach out to the presenters if you have additional questions. Uh, their contact information is here and also in your console. And as a reminder, if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I will keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download. And a copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And also, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. And finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.